Welcome to Exploring the Mystical Side of Life with your host, Linda Lang. This is Linda Lang from ThoughtChange.com. We are here today exploring the mystical side of life with Julie Ryan. Julie is a businesswoman, entrepreneur, inventor who has turned woo-woo and now she is a medical medium, a psychic. Welcome, Julie. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I wanted to do a show about near-death experiences or the death experience for some time. That's one of your expertise areas, correct? Well, yeah. I've had a lot of experience with it and I, and I teach what happens when somebody's dying because what I find, Linda, is there's a lot of information out there about what happens to people who've had a near-death experience. There's lots of information about the afterlife, and there's information even about how to grieve when we lose a loved one. But there's not a lot of information about what's happening as we're actually dying. And I think that's what so many people are afraid of is the experience and what's happening. And certainly people are afraid that, that have grown up in a culture where they're taught, okay, there's a heaven and a hell. And so people are worried, am I going to fly or am I going to fry when I die? And so there's a lot of fear that surrounds it. Yeah. And I think that that's something that we'd really do well to release. I see death as a portal into the next phase. adventure. So what happens when we die, Julie? Well, we're spirits connected to a body having a human experience. And what happens is the spirit, as I perceive it, Linda, is the main part of, that's, the, that's us. That's the everlasting part of us. And then the body goes inside of the spirit. Like, and it's all holographic. So when we die, the spirit and the body separate. The spirit is the power source for the body. Which is why when somebody dies and their spirit and their body separate, their body doesn't work anymore because it doesn't have a power source. I've seen deceased people mm -hmm. and they really, it's like they're made out of clay. You know, they're not there. Yeah. Yeah. Like the power source has been turned off. Yeah. And so what happens, Linda, is as we're dying, our spirit exits through the top of our head, which is what near-death experience people talk about, that they feel like they're going through a tunnel and they can see a bright light at the end of the tunnel. And that's what's happening. They, they're seeing the light when they're coming out of their body. And then the, the spirit holds on to the body at the top of the head. And it looks like a bubble that you'd see in a cartoon caption where the character's thoughts or their what they're saying is located. And then they're surrounded by angels and deceased loved ones and the spirits of deceased pets. And that configuration of angels and loved ones and pets changes as the person approaches death. And I call that the 12 phases of transition. And you can see these illustrated on my website, AskJulieRyan.com. If you click on the 12 phases of transition link in the, you know, tab in the, in my website, you'll see these depicted and the angels show up, Linda, and these, it's important to say that angels look to me like big winged creatures with white robes, belted at the waist with a rope, you know, the whole nine yards. And that's because I went to 12 years of Catholic schools. So certainly that's what I was taught angels look like. Somebody that grew up perhaps in an indigenous culture in the Amazon or somewhere, they may see angels as a blob of purple energy. We're going to see spirits in a way that's going to make sense to us in our human mind. So we'll have a frame of reference. So for me, angels are just energy but they appear to me in a way that looks like what I was taught to believe angels look like. And they, they show up and they're in a circle around the person who's dying. And then as they approach death, that circle opens up into a horseshoe and eventually opens up into a straight line. And then there are thousands of other spirits that show up, spirits from other lifetimes, people that we knew in other lifetimes and in this lifetime, people who are close to us who are deceased. And then the pets too, with Soraya, if somebody's grown up on a farm, perhaps they will be farm animals and 
And it's important to remember too, Linda, that time doesn't exist in the spirit world. Time is a human creation, a human concoction. So if somebody is dying in a instant death, like a homicide or a suicide, they go through the 12 phases. If they're dying and it's prolonged over days, weeks, months, even years, same thing. Everybody goes through what I perceive to be the 12 phases of transition. And it's glorious. It, it adds a really comforting, glorious component to a heart-wrenching situation in a lot of instances. You know, we have a loved one who's dying and we're just, it feels like our heart's being torn out of our chest. And this adds a glorious component to it. It helps lessen it a little when we know, okay, they're surrounded by angels and deceased loved ones. And, and also when somebody's dying, not only is it scary for us because we're going to lose that person, but it's also scary for us because we're facing our own mortality. First of all, you said we're greeted by spirits, thousands of spirits, perhaps from past lives. When does our memory return after we leave our body? Instantly. Yes. Yeah. Instantly. Very interesting. And again, I think of my own father's passing over and it seemed very much like he would be in the body and out of the body and in the body. Mm -hmm. I tend to think the spirit, especially if there's a lot of pain involved or trauma, that the spirit does pop out of the body and maybe witnesses it more so than is experiencing all that pain and discomfort. Oh yeah. And our spirits pop out of our bodies all the time. Most people's spirits leave their bodies at night when they're asleep and we do what's called astral travel. So the other time, Linda, that's funny when I see people that have their spirits have separated from their bodies is when somebody comes back from surgery and they're oftentimes under anesthesia, they haven't woken up yet. And the spirit will be flying around the room and having a big time, kind of like, reminds me of the cartoon Casper the Friendly Ghost. And, it, and it's not that they are separating for good. It's just they're temporarily having fun out traveling around. That might explain why you wake up tired some mornings. Yeah, <laughs> you've been out partying too much in the spirit world the night before. So interesting. So I'm sure we've all heard or read about situations where people have had near-death experiences and we're told, no, you know, it's time to go back. Is our death time set in stone? That is a great question. And it has been my experience that we all decide when we go, where we go, who's with us, what we go, and what the circumstances are uh, when we leave, when we transition. And you can talk to any funeral director anywhere in the world. And they have countless stories about families who sat with grandma for three weeks. And then Aunt Susie was on duty with grandma and Aunt Susie left the room to go get a cup of coffee. And she was out of the room maybe for three minutes. And then what happens? Grandma decides to check out while Aunt Susie's out of the room. And then Aunt Susie's guilt ridden because she's thinking, oh, I wasn't there when she passed. Well, grandma was orchestrating all of that. So every funeral director will tell you, yes, there are countless stories like that. And, and that it's, it's not your time. It's time to go back. It's all our spirit's prerogative to choose whether we want to go back or not. It's not coming from some edict that when you get the, to the pearly <laughs> gates, you're told, okay, you need to go back because you're not ready to die yet. That's, that's not how I perceive it. It's, it's more, okay, well, I'll go back and I'll see what else I'm going to experience. Cause it's all about what our spirit is experiencing in this lifetime. And it helps our spirit expand each lifetime. And we all live thousands and thousands, if not more lifetimes, endless, many, 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 many. And what about the review of your life? I've heard so many people talk about a review that it's almost as if they lived their life in, in a few moments and felt the emotions and the energy. There are a lot of schools of thought of people that, that have had a near death experience or have communicated with deceased loved ones who were told that keep in mind, time doesn't exist in the spirit world. So a hundred years in our lifetime may be reviewed in less than a nanosecond. 
And which is hard for us to wrap our human minds around that because we don't have a frame of reference for that. But that's what I've been told. So yes, I've heard that a lot. And then what happens after that? Whatever we want to happen. What I'm told is that we can manifest anything we want instantly, which is why spirits decide to come to earth because they think it's fun to be able to manifest something over time. And keep in mind in this spirit world too, Linda, there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. So it's just an experience and our, our spirit expands each time we have an experience. So it's kind of like going to Disneyland. And so it's just an experience. It's how we perceive it. It's how we expand from it. So for instance, let's say you lost a child in this lifetime. And it's horrific. No negating the human aspect, the human side of the equation. It's horrific. But perhaps in a past life, you were the child that died and you wanted to feel what it was like to be the parent of, or you were the sibling of, or the friend of, or the grandparent of, or whatever. What I find is that a lot of times we'll repeat scripts and we'll look at it from different perspectives so that we can see all sides of the equation to learn, okay, well, when I was the child that died, this is what it felt like to me, but I can't imagine what it felt like to my mom. So I'll come back next lifetime or, or in a subsequent lifetime where I lose a child so that I can explore what it feels like to be the parent who loses the child. What about karma? Karma is not, I don't believe what we've been taught it to be kind of like, you know, if you're bad in this lifetime, you're going to come back and you're going to suffer in a future lifetime. Because again, there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad in the spirit world. It's just an experience. Karma, as I perceive it, Linda, is more of, we come in with a basic script of something that we want to explore. Let's say you want to be a teacher. Well, there are about a bazillion ways that you can be a teacher, right? Not just in a classroom, in a we're, school. We're all teachers. We're all teachers, absolutely. Every parent, every, every person is a teacher in some way. And so that's where free will comes in. We get to explore whatever we want and we'll look at it at different nuances. You may have many, many lifetimes where you're a teacher, but you're a teacher in a different capacity. And so we'll have these scripts that will repeat through multiple lifetimes with lots of subscripts obviously involved. And an example that I use is imagine there's a, a movie. Well, one, uh, A Star is Born was out a couple of years ago with Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. That was a fourth remake of the same script. I saw that movie when I was in high school with Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson. So different timeline, different location, different cast of characters, oftentimes different gender, same script, looking at it from a different perspective. But this is from a soul level. Yeah. Does our human self have any say in it? Oh, absolutely. That's where free will comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your spirit wants to come in and explore being a teacher and then your your humanness is saying, hmm, maybe I'll teach music. Maybe I'll teach dog tricks to pets. It, it really is endless how we can choose to explore whatever that script is. Frankly, I have founded nine companies in five industries. I came in obviously as a creator. It's still the basic script. I'm going through my life creating things just in a different capacity. And so Julie, what about people that have like really, really challenging, challenging lives and a lot of trauma? Does their spirit need like rest time when they get to the other side or healing? My sense of this is no, because it's all a human experience. So the spirit is here to have an experience. Again, it's not good, it's not bad. We see things as horrific in our humanness. I don't even know if that's a real word, but I use it. And we don't know what that spirit has experienced in this lifetime leading up to these horrific events, let alone in many past lifetimes. So like the example that I used before, if you lose a child, 
somebody is going through a horrific experience, maybe in a past life, they were the parent of, the sibling of, the spouse of, the friend of, the caregiver of, whatever. And they want to explore in this lifetime what's happening. And when we look at it that way, Linda, I think it helps us really be accepting of things that we we can't control and we don't want to control it because that's what that person has chosen to experience. What happens is we feel badly about it. So it's more about us than it is them, which sounds selfish and it's not, it's just human nature. But for instance, when we have a loved one who's dying, we're addressing our own mortality, whether we're aware of it or not. We're like, oh God, we're going to be there someday. And, and so things that are horrific, if we can look at it from it's benefiting that person in some way, again, not to negate how awful it is from the human perspective, but what I do is I say, hmm, wonder how that's benefiting that person's spirit. And it helps negate the negative bad feelings that I'm feeling, which really have more to do with me than it does with that person. The other thing I think that's important to remember too, Linda, is that emotions are our, A-R-E-O-U-R, are our internal GPS system. So our spirit is pure love, which feels good. It at least feels neutral. When we feel badly about something, even boredom, boredom, anger, jealousy, fear, whatever, that's our spirit saying, hey, you're out of alignment. Look at this from a different perspective. So that ends up being really handy. And if I'm watching something on the news and I see something really awful happening, I'll immediately go to my human side and say, oh my God. And I feel terrible. And then I say, okay, but it's benefiting them in some way. And then it gets me back to neutral, gets me back in alignment with my spirit. Doesn't mean you got to be zippity doo da day and down the street. It just means that you're in alignment with spirit. And that's how we expand and we go forward. And that's how we get inspiration. That's a lovely tip, Julie, especially right now, because there's so much happening in the world that really put a lot of people off balance. I agree. Very good. Very good. So is there anything we can do to make it easier for people we know, our loved ones when they cross over or for ourselves when it's our turn? Absolutely. We can understand that there's a glorious component to it, that the person who's passed, they decided this was the perfect time for them. I think too, when somebody is in the throes of grief, what I say a lot to people, Linda, and what I suggest is think of grief as waves of the ocean. The ocean is calm and then the wave breaks and it comes in with a lot of force and a lot of power and then it recedes and then it's calm again. So when you're in the throes of grieving and we need to allow that those waves of grief to come in, Picture waves of the ocean. Something will trigger, perhaps you're crying or you're feeling terrible or you're really missing your loved one who's passed. And then know that that wave of grief is going to recede like waves of the ocean, that it's going to get calm. And then like high tide and low tide, you're going to have times where the grief is really intense and it's just almost unbearable for some people. And then you're going to have times where it gets calm and it's low tide. And know that that's going to happen. And then over time, what happens is it, it you, we don't ever stop missing our loved ones, but it certainly gets easier. The, the raw, rawness of the emotion starts to subside, starts to recede like waves of the ocean. And I think it's probably really healthy if you can tap into that sense of respect and honor for that person and their life and and the role that they played in your life exactly i had a a client that i was talking to just right before i got on with you and she lost her stepson to a drug overdose it was fentanyl and so we talked to her son spirit and he said it was laced it was not pure, you know, I mean, it had, it was corrupted 
and it killed him unexpectedly. And she was very angry that he had let his addiction go in that order. Well, she happened to be an addict, a recovering addict herself. She had been an alcoholic. And so by talking telepathically with her stepson, what came in was this really is giving you the opportunity to look at your own fear about your recovery and not as much about him. And it, it, it was really interesting how it all made sense to her and it gave her a lot of comfort. It's beautiful work that you do. I personally think that our loved ones do come and visit us and they oh, yeah. all the time, but sometimes we don't know. Often we don't know. Or if we do know, maybe we don't understand the message. Well, everybody can do this. We all come in with the ability. I learned how to do all this stuff that I do. And that's what I teach. I teach classes to people all over the world who have no, don't think they have any skill sets. And everybody comes in with the ability. It's just learning to develop and enhance it. But may I, may I give some pointers of how everybody can do this? Absolutely. Okay. Our heads are big satellite dishes, Linda, and they receive and they transmit frequencies. Every thought has its own frequency. It originates in the ethers. It does not originate in our head. We pull it in and every spirit has its own frequency, like a radio channel broadcasts on whatever megahertz. So when we want to talk to a deceased loved one in order to tune our satellite dish in with their frequency, all we have to do is think of them and they immediately come in. And it's not just for people who we've known, it's for anybody. You want to talk to Aristotle, you want to talk to Mother Teresa, it doesn't matter. You want to talk to whomever, you talk, you think of that person and you're immediately connected to them. And then spirits are really literal and they're going to communicate telepathically. So when you say something to a spirit, whether they're attached to a body or not, I mean, we can do this with people who are alive. That's how I do all my medical scans with people all over the world. My spirit connects with their spirit. And so what happens is you say something to them and you're going to get a thought in your head immediately, as fast as you can snap your fingers. If you think about it for more than a couple of seconds, that's going to be your brain talking to you. That's how you know that it's coming from spirit. And it's important to remember, remember that spirits are super literal. For instance, here's an example. If you say, hey, mom, are we going to enjoy the movie? You get a yeah in your head. So you're watching some movie tonight and it's awful. And you're thinking, ah, what's up with that? Well, she gave you a correct answer as spirit will always give us a correct answer. But the answer, the way you ask the question could pertain to any movie you watch throughout the rest of your life. Versus if you said, hey, mom, are we going to enjoy watching Frozen 2 on Disney Plus tonight? See the difference in how the question's asked? So we want to be really specific when we are asking, especially for guidance. And, and all you have to do is think of somebody. Likewise, when you're in the middle of doing something like cooking dinner or folding laundry or you're on a walk or whatever, and that person comes into your mind, that's them letting you know that they're close by. But the other fun thing too, Linda, is baby spirits attached to the mom's energy field before they're conceived. And they look like a little orb over the shoulder. And if a mom's going to have more than one child, they'll be stacked out like in the distance. Like, it reminds me of planes coming in to land at night and they have their landing lights on. And you can see them stacked out waiting for clearance to land. And so it's fun to see mo future moms because the baby's energy can attach years in advance. And it's not just babies that she's going to birth. It can be adopted babies. It can be miscarried babies can be, it's just that spirit is attached to the mom's energy field, which is really fun to see. Fascinating. I've really enjoyed my conversation with you today, Julie. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now you have a couple of books, one in particular about the death process. I do. I happen to have one right here. It's called Angelic Attendance, What Really Happens As We Transition From This Life Into The Next. And then I have two children's books, Angel Messages for Dogs and Angel Messages for Kids. And it teaches children that were spirits attached to a body and that we can talk to our deceased loved ones and we can talk to our deceased pets. 
And those came about with, I've had so many moms over the years ask me to write something so they can explain this to their kids because little kids come in knowing how to do all this stuff. Your website, Julie, is? AskJulieRyan.com. And you have a podcast. Have a podcast. It's live every Thursday night from 8 to 10 Eastern. And people call in and ask Julie Ryan about medical stuff. I scan them medically. I do energetic healings on them. It's really fun. And it's available anywhere you download podcasts. And you can live stream it from my website as well. Or you can call in. All the call-in numbers are all on my social media at Ask Julie Ryan. And also on my website at AskJulieRyan.com. Wonderful. We'll put the links in the show notes. And thank you for listening to this week's episode of Exploring the Mystical Side of Life. You will find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, at ThoughtChange.com. Come and visit me. Pick up your copy of Learning to Listen. And check out my course, Alchemy from the Inside Out. That's it for this week. Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Exploring the Mystical Side of Life. Remember to subscribe and stay tuned for more amazing episodes.